This is the, the best radio ever. Go help her, she fell. Goodness sakes. She got hurt. Well, I can't fool you guys. This post-war war II Japanese clone machine, and I've got to come out in this shot so you can see our friends, Umi, and also her friend, right over here. So this is not a radio, right? It's not a radio. You guys were, I, I could hear you snickering off camera there. You as well, Umi. I could hear you snickering too. Like, <laughs> they're not going to buy it. It's a radio. This is actually uh, a machine that came out of the post World War II Japanese rebuilding effort. It was one of the earlier ones, actually. Let me come out a little bit further, too, on this shot. So, if you don't know anything about that piece of history, as we were in the midst of World War II, and it looked like there was no end in sight, well, behind the scenes, they were developing the atomic bomb. And as most of you know, eventually that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then Japan surrendered unconditionally, and that ended World War II. Well, when a war is done, we don't necessarily just step away from the country and let them kind of pick up the pieces on their own. We always have a big heart when it comes to our nation. That, that can bite us in the rear sometimes because we're, we're stepping on and trying to help everyone. And sometimes we miss opportunities to help our own. I'm not going to get up on that soapbox right now. But we decided to step out and help out the Japanese rebuild their economy after World War II ended. And one of the things that we did is we gave them the designs and patents for a number of different sewing machines. And then they, kind of like Baskin Robbins, came up with a huge variety of different flavors of sewing machines that were then eventually imported into the United States and sold to Americans post-World War II. And I've talked about this before that Initially, they oftentimes, right on the front of the machine, like a badge of honor, right about in this realm there where you can see up, silk, down, which is obviously referring to uh, the feed dog positions. But usually right there prominently on the front of the machine, right on the pillar where everyone can see it, initially they were badge marking them made in Japan. Well, they ran into some rocky waters because of that. People still had a bitterness about our fight with the Japanese, and so eventually they moved it sometimes to the inside of the pillar, sometimes to the back of the pillar, and even to the side of the pillar, right about there. You might be able to read it. Uh, deluxe, made in Japan. And then they eventually took a path, as some of you know through, from following my premieres very closely, they eventually came to a point where they created what I'll consider to be fake companies with American sounding names and they would badge mark the machines with those names. You know, it might be ABC Sewing Company, blah, 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 whatever it is. 
But again, they were trying to overcome the objection of importing their machines into this uh, very fertile market of the United States where everyone at that time, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, were all interested in the idea of having a sewing machine, a quality sewing machine in their household. And I can tell you that the Japanese, they did generally a good job of building their machines. They were built to quality. They were built uh, very well. And they had the, uh, the forged steel throughout. Here's the only problem. Where did they get the metal? Whenever you've had a long-term war, precious metals and metals in general are very, very scarce for manufacturing. Where would they get the metal to make all of these sewing machines now that the Japanese had the patents and the designs from the Americans? Well, they went into the waters where a number of Navy vessels went down during the war, some of them American, some of them other countries that were involved in the Second World War uh, effort, some of them Japanese vessels as well. The only problem with harvesting this uh, incredibly heavy gauge metal, and that's why the Japanese machines generally are some of the heaviest that are made, uh, the only problem with harvesting this heavy gauge metal that used to be a, a Navy vessel from one country or another is it's been soaking in salt water, sometimes for an extended period of time, years. And what does salt water do to metal? Type it in the chat while I am getting some music on for us. By the way, I have to give credit to YouTube. The uh, the sound effects you heard at the beginning uh, were uh, sound effects that are available through the audio library on YouTube. So I've got to give credit to those good folks. All right, let me see if I can bring this back to life. It's acting like it doesn't want to do anything. So if you typed into the chat, if you typed into the chat that, hoping I don't have to do this over again, that would be really irritating. Um, if you typed into the chat that the problem with harvesting this heavy gauge metal that would have been used on these Navy vessels from various countries is, it has a tendency to rust because of the salt water. Well, that would be absolutely, absolutely correct uh, as far as the impact of harvesting metal like that. But they did it anyway. And so the problem with a lot of these Japanese machines is they will... <laughs> will all of a sudden crank on music and blast your eardrums out. <laughs> they will uh, use it anyway and then over time it'll start to rust. It'll start to work its way through the real pretty finishes that were put on a lot of these machines. And this is a lovely finish. A lot of people like this finish. It's kind of a robin's egg color. Uh, you might have another description for it as far as the color that you're seeing on screen there. And I should rewind a little bit and tell you who the owner of this machine is. It is a Wisconsin lady by the name of Penny Young. Kind of a cool name, huh? Penny Young. And this machine actually belongs to her sister. She brought two machines to the workshop, traveled a good distance within the state to come to the workshop. And the main concerns with this machine was it had a bobbin winding issue, and I'll be putting in the description of this uh, premiere all of the links for the Facebook shots that I posted there, so you'll be able to see them. And also, we'll take a peek at some of them 
during this uh, premiere as well because I want you to understand the progress and the process that I've taken these machines through so that you understand the workshop difference, the workshop magic as I sometimes refer to it. But this machine also had a lot of buildup inside. It needed deep cleaning, it needed adjustments, uh, it needed rust mitigation. It was not spared uh, that issue of rust because some of this, uh, some of the parts of this machine were harvested from those Navy vessels. And so I, I had to go in there and get, mitigate the rust and then put a special coating on that metal to protect it and to prevent or discourage that rust from returning. So we're going to be checking out this Japanese machine today, which is badge marked Dressmaker. There were a number of sewing machine makers that latched onto that name because it was catchy, Dressmaker. What do you do with it? I make dresses. Well, a lot of people back in the day made dresses with their sewing machines. At that time, buying material in the stores, a lot of it was imported and it was a lot more expensive uh, to get it but later those prices dropped and then it was a lot cheaper to get your own material make your own dresses and then you know avoid going into the retail establishments that were starting to crop up with a lot of the designer labels and a lot of the other import type garments that had met, been made and then they bumped the price way up so people were still making dresses back you know in the day and uh, they were able to do it much more cost effectively. So a lot of makers latched on to dress maker, just like on this machine here. So with that, blah, 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 see if I can figure out what's going on with the music. I'm also gonna turn my heater back on. When I was sharing those radio sounds, I, I didn't wanna have the, that playing at the same time. So let's see here. So a little bit about this machine, a little bit about this machine, it comes with a rear, mount, rear, rear mounted motor and it's rated at 1.3 amps. That should have your attention right away. 1.3 amps, if that's the actual output of the motor, is huge on a machine like this. Now, a lot of the Japanese motors were made in Japan and were, they were badge marked to appear as if they were from the U.S. We come off the uh, tripod real quick and look at this one. Let's see what we see. And I capture this in the progress shots as well. Let's zoom in on that if we can without the camera going out of focus, hopefully. So you can see this one is a standard motor. Standard motors were made in the U.S. <coughs> Excuse me. 75 cycles, and again, they're rating it at 1.3 amps. I don't know that I agree that it's going to give you that much output, and you're going to lose some of that power because it is obviously uh, a belt-driven machine. It's not a direct drive machine, but you're still going to be able to you're, you're going to be able to sew some pretty heavy stuff with this machine. Um, a lot of people love the Japanese clone machines. When I was posting these progress shots, I had a couple of people chime in on the comments and say, I just love Japanese clone machines. And no, I don't think it was you. Although I know you do have a Facebook account. She does, Umi. She really does. But there's a lot to like and some people have other camps of thought on these Japanese clone machines where they think that they're a cheap knockoff and uh, they don't like the fact that a lot of the Japanese clone machines have this offset needle feature and that means you can never get a genuine center needle position it's always going to be offset to the left and they did that very intentionally for seam allowance they thought that it would be a beneficial thing and for many it is but there's others that don't like the fact that they have no control over needle position on these machines, unless you goof around with this, which is not a radio knob like I was kidding about in the beginning 
of this Premier, but this is actually your adjuster for stitch width. And uh, you can release these, and then it'll all of a sudden go all the way to zero. On zero, you're going to obviously be sewing a, uh, just a straight stitch. And then incrementally, you can turn this, and you can go all the way up to five, which is a really wide zigzag. Or while you're sewing, like on some of the Necky machines, you can manipulate this and kind of design your own patterns as well. And when you think about the FOF 130-6s that I've shown on this channel, remember that? The one that belonged to Alberto? And then eventually I did another one for, for Alberto's sister, and they went down to Texas. Well, remember that embroidery kit that's on the back of that 130-6? It uses a special rod that comes to the front of that controller, and then it manipulates stitch width to generate a huge variety of stitch outputs from that embroidery kit that mounts on the rear of that 130-6. Well, here, your hand can be the embroidery kit. So instead of having the luxury of cams built into a mechanical embroidery kit like on the FOF 130-6 that you've seen on this channel before, and if you haven't seen it before, then by all means go to the landing page, go to the little hourglass thingy, and type in the search FOF 130-6 and then you'll be able to check out that machine. It really is a phenomenal step of engineering with having that rod that comes from that embroidery kit and then it manipulates that stitch width to generate all those cool stitches. Well, here you can be that. You can, you know, do this and do that and, and kind of manipulate it as you go a little bit. Right, yeah, why not? Do you feel like you could be an embroidery kit? Yes, you could. You're so doggone talented. You could pull it off. So instead of these actually being radio knobs, I'll show you what they're for, but I'll do it when I'm not holding a camera in the other hand. But I'll describe to you what they do now. They set the width boundaries for the zigzag. So if you move this little knob, say right to there, and then you tighten this left one that I'm pointing my finger at, then this boundary will not go below that it'll set it right there and then you can bring it higher up and you can set this one and then you can lock the boundary in on the high end so the high end and the low end and then you can manipulate that stitch potentially in between those two set boundaries that's kind of what this these two little knobs do I'd love to tell you that you can tune into the fire department like we did or you could tune into the ambulance service like we did or you can start a car and you can tune the radio like we did but that's just the magic of this Hollywood workshop. Yeah, if you didn't know, we got just a little bit of Hollywood with John Lennon. We got a little bit of Hollywood over there too. So that's just the, the magic of Hollywood that we were able to do that. Now when you're setting this machine up to sew, oh, let me, let me go way back. So this right here, this control, you can slide all the way to the right to drop the feed dogs all the way. If you're sewing something light like a silk or a satin, you can move this into the middle range and then those feed dogs will be recessed just slightly to soften the, uh, the bite of those uh, feed dogs on that material. Or for regular sewing, you can have it in the up position like we do right now. That's kind of what all of that is about. Yeah. This right here is going to give you control over stitch length. You can see right now if we move this, we can go way down on stitch length. I wouldn't go all the way to zero because then we're not going to get any material movement at all. We're probably going to be sewing in the five, three to five range most of the time. And then if you want to use the reversed, reverse function of the machine, you just push this in. Hold it in while you want to sew in reverse. It's not a two-stager, like on that 19E special that I showed you recently. And then release it when you want to resume sewing forward again. And then I've already shown you what kind of what this does. This allows you to set your zigzag width somewhere between one and five, or to set it on zero for straight stitching. What else can I tell you about this machine? 
When you're setting up the needle on this machine, you want to make sure that the flat side is to the right, pointing towards that motor or towards that pillar. And you're going to be threading this machine from left to right. The bobbin is actually mounted on the side of the machine. You'll see that in some of the progress shots down over here, which is kind of a classic rotary setup for what you would normally see with a class 15 rotary style machine. Either on the front, but typically on the side, they're gonna have it set up like this. And we actually use a class 15 style bobbin on this machine as well. And I'll be showing you bobbin winding as well, because on this machine, you've got a limitation where it has kind of a governor, a built-in stop point for that, uh, the fullness of that bobbin. And that was part of the challenge when I rebuilt this and replaced some parts on this was seeing if I could somehow bypass that, but it's engineered into the machine. So I'm gonna show you a cheater's way of going past that stop point on the bobbin fullness and being able to fill that bobbin a lot fuller. Yeah, we're gonna do that. You can also pop open this faceplate if you'd like to. I'm not gonna go real far with it because We've got the, uh, the the machine threaded up right now, and I don't want to goof that up. I might have goofed it up already. I wouldn't be surprised if I did. Blah, blah, blah. All right, let's tighten that up a little bit. <laughs> I like to show you guys everything, but then sometimes I run into challenges, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. So you can look inside of the faceplate as well, and you can see, number one, it's a very clean machine now. Everything has been serviced and adjusted, which you wouldn't expect anything less in the workshop, right? But the other thing you can see is that it's built very well. Even though it was sunken naval forged steel that was used, and it's prone to rusting, it's super sturdy, it's super strong, and uh, yeah, but you can't float it. Don't try floating the machine, especially if it's plugged in. And right now we've got an incandescent bulb in there. I did not have an LED equivalent. It's not a 5 8 base that screws in. It's much smaller than that. So uh, I'll just let the customer know that there are options out there if they want to eliminate the heat factor because this puts out a lot of heat. And it also you know, it doesn't generate quite as much brightness down on the needle. And that is my phone going off because I forgot, I forgot to shut it off. Let me do that now. All right. We're ignoring that call. Sorry about that, whoever that was. Okay, I'll, I'll adjust the volume once I have both my hands back again. So let's real quick, while we are while we have the faceplate open, let's look at the threading on this. And, and I didn't mention the setup. Let me go like way back. The setup on this machine today is we have my beloved 9014 Universal Needle. 9014 Universal Needle. And uh, so we're going to be able to sew a relatively wide scope of material choices. But the customer is arriving soon. So I'm not going to run this premiere incredibly long because that will become a problem, okay? So coming off the top, you'll notice that we are using Guterman 100% silk thread. Isn't that a pretty color? I chose that color in particular because it seemed to complement the patina on this Japanese clone machine. But again, with silk thread, it does have a tendency to fray. Uh, it really isn't designed to sew leather, but we're going to do that today anyway. And uh, but it, but it is surprisingly strong. I've, I've shown this thread to you before. This Guterman 100% silk, and I buy this at Joanne Fabrics. Uh, Joanne Fabrics is everywhere, but I buy it from my friends out in Marinette, Wisconsin. So if you're local, you can go out to Marinette, Wisconsin. Tell them that the Cow Country guy sent you there. They know me because I give them these really cool posters of the Soaholic lady, but on a smaller scale. And so they always love seeing me coming in the door because they know typically I'm going to be bringing in more posters. And the other great thing about their silk threads at Joanne Fabrics, to give them a shameless plug, 
is they tend to do sales on this because not a lot of people know or use silk thread. Don't know why. It's fabulous thread. And again, surprisingly strong. But they sometimes will give you options at Joanne Fabrics of buy three, get two free. So you walk out the door having only paid for three of them, but you get five. That's pretty doggone good. So at any rate, blah, blah, blah. The threading now, right? The threading coming off the top. We come across the top of the machine. We come through this little thread guide right here, this little thread point, which you see these on the, on the FOF machines a lot. Now, technically, I don't have to thread through all three of these. I can go in the middle one and then come out the bottom one and then come down to the tension discs. But I decided to use all three. So I, I threaded it through the top one I threaded it through the top one, came around through the middle one, came back through the bottom one, and then we come down to the tension discs. And I've said this a lot, but I'm going to say it again, okay? I'm going to say it again. Always, always, always make sure that your presser foot lever, which is on the rear of the machine, excuse me, ladies, it's on the rear of the machine right about, where is it? Right about there. Can you see that? Sort of? Where it is? There it is. That's our presser foot lever. Make sure it's all the way in the up position. Now, the tricky thing about some of these Japanese clone machines is they have a two-stage presser foot lever, which means when you're down in the down position and you're sewing... Let me, let me stand up. I'm kneeling right now, and this is really awkward. When you're sewing, and it's in the down position, obviously, and you go go to finish that stitch line and you're like okay I want to raise the press foot pressure now and uh, get that lever up and move the material you might come right to here right but right here you're still gonna have pressure on the discs you have to push it one more stage up to that position all the way at the highest point and then it releases all the pressure on the discs so you basically have a couple of stages you got a stage there you got a little stage there, and then finally you have a stage all the way at the top. So make sure when you're working with a Japanese clone machine, if it has a multi-stage type presser foot lever, that you bring that all the way to the highest position before you try drawing that thread to clip your ends and the, to, to do another stitch line. Otherwise, you're going to potentially damage the machine or just get really frustrated. So all the way to the top is how we want to have it when we're threading the machine as well. Oh, this is our on-off right here for the light. Off and on. Okay, now I can sit back down or kneel again. So with, with nothing as far as pressure on those discs, you can see that. We're coming through there with the thread. We're coming around the bottom. And then we're going in between kind of past the end of that spring right there and then coming right in between then we're going to be going underneath this thread guide right here and coming up through this opening right there so we kind of come underneath and then we come through that opening then we go to the take-up arm right here threading it from right to left and then we've got a little hidden thread point right inside of the face plate right here when we open up the face plate you can see that thread point right there as well. Now we're going to come down here. We've got another thread point here. You can see that right there. And then finally we're going to be threading this machine from again left to right. Okay? So that's the threading on that and that's going to be fairly consistent with most Japanese clone type machines. I'll also let you know if you're a do-it-yourselfer type person and you want to tear this machine down uh, for deep cleaning and all that, just be aware that the uh, upper tension, kind of like some of the Kenmore's, it's a little bit tricky in its setup. So, uh, you know, just be real careful in lining up your pieces, uh, and uh, you'll be able to see that a little bit in some of the progress shots as well that I'll post. Again, I'll show some of them to you now, and then I'll post some of them as well in the description of this. Uh, ones that I did not show you, so you'll want to check those out. Oh, I know. Also, you can see right up here, we've got 
uh, our presser foot controller for extra presser foot pressure. I feel like I'm spitting on myself right now. If you want to release all of it, just push on this outer ring. Now there's no presser foot pressure on it at all. And then you can see these little grooves kind of like on it. You can push it down in stages depending on the type of material that you're sewing. Again, the general rule is if you're sewing something super light like this Kona 100% uh, cotton that uh, Paula Noel sent to the workshop for me as a Christmas gift. She sent several of these along and I just demonstrated this for the first time on her 401A that is heading towards her in Florida right now. I don't think it's arrived yet. I didn't get a text message or anything like that from her. I'm guessing she would be a bubble machine saying, it's here, it's here! But I haven't heard that, so I'm guessing it's still in transit. But uh, when you're sewing lighter stuff like this Kona 100% cotton material, you're probably going to lighten this up a little bit. And so instead of going all the way down you know, to the, to the bottom point, we might go right around middle level. And it is a little bit of a spitball because... You know, with this sew up, for example, we've got the two layers of 100% Kona uh, cotton, 100% uh, cotton, and then we've got that, uh, not a stabilizer, but it's uh, basically a batting in between the two layers. So we'll have to see how this feeds. If we start to get bunching, then we know that our presser foot pressure is too high, and we'll have to lighten this up a little bit. But when we're doing our leather sew offs, yes, we're going to be sewing leather with 100% silk thread. Crazy, right? I know. Plus, we're again not going to be using a leather needle. We're going to be using a 9014 universal needle that has been designed from the point to the scarf to the shaft to be able to accommodate a wide field of materials, including leather. And uh, that's part of the reason I use these needles is I don't have to be changing them out you know, from an embroidery needle to uh, a leather needle to a standard needle to a, you know, whatever. Uh, they just give you a really wide scope of sewing capabilities with that one needle. So we'll have to decide, but when I'm doing the leather, I'm probably going to be a lot further down. But again, the beauty of these, if you didn't know it, is total release of the presser foot pressure. So right now, we could literally take that presser foot and we can kind of manipulate it a little bit. See that? Let me zoom in a little bit closer. You can kind of manipulate it, just kind of grab it like this. And because there's no pressure on it, we can push it up and down, up and down. Which is kind of cool because look at the clearance when you do that. That's like, are you insane? So, I mean, if you wanted to cheat and uh, get something really thick underneath the presser foot, you could always do that. You could release it temporarily right here by pushing that outer ring. And then you could just lift that up manually, get your material in place, and then apply the presser foot pressure again so it'll feed it through. Because you know what? If you're putting something so thick underneath the presser foot, because you got a lot of clearance already with this Japanese clone machine. Look at that. So if you need more clearance than that, then you're probably going to be looking at adding a fair amount of pressure to be able to feed that over the feed dogs and underneath the presser foot. So you would be way down into this range, if not all the way max pedal to the metal. So, But it's nice. It gives you that graduated control. And it's a lot easier, in some respects, to just push it down. Oh, that's about right. Now a little bit further. Then on most of the machines where you have to turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. Turn it reverse it, reverse it, reverse it, reverse it. So again, nice engineering feature uh, to have that available to us. What else? Did I miss anything else? I, I don't think I specifically mentioned it, but again, as far as setup, a quick review on setup. Flat side of the needle goes to the right towards the pillar. You're going to be threading this machine from left to right. When you put your bobbin into your bobbin case down here, make sure that you have that thread coming over the top. So that as that bobbin unwinds, it's going to be turning counterclockwise. That's really important stuff. Yeah. And again, winding a bobbin will kind of check that out so I can show my customer's sister, you know, how to bypass the governor that's built into this 
uh, bobbin winding design. Again, some bobbin winders will allow you some discretion. Like on the recent 401A I showed you of Paula Noel's, I showed you that little retention plate above it that you can loosen the screw and you can raise it up to make that bobbin fill more or you can loosen that screw and lower it down further if you don't want the bobbin as full. On this one, you're stuck with the built-in fill ratio, which is only about 50% on an average bobbin, a class 15 bobbin. And that can be really irritating to somebody like it was with Penny's sister. So after I replace the parts that needed replacement on here, I'll now show you a bypass when we wind a bobbin so you can get away with filling that bobbin nice and full, even though it's not designed to do that. Yeah, a little bobbin winding hack. Yeah, cool. Just seeing if there's anything else I forgot. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I've given you a pretty good uh, overview of uh, this uh, post-World War II Japanese clone machine badge-marked dressmaker. Yeah, all right. So all of that blah, 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 blah. Get the camera back on the tripod. We'll zoom in because we're out in left field somewhere right now. We might even be in the parking lot. Okay. Give me just one moment here. I'm doing this uh, music playing on my newer laptop right now, and it's not going automatically through the songs. I don't know why that is. Let me try this again. Oh no, that's sound effects. I don't want sound effects. You silly sailor. Let's try this again. This is kind of a cool song. Oh, I know what else I wanted to show you too. Um, there are also tension issues with this machine as well, so I'm going to show you kind of a migration of uh, calibrating that tension until I finally got it exactly where I wanted it. See, hopefully I can do that. So all the way on the left is when I was first, after I got done with all of the servicing repairs on the machine, then I jump into the actual sew-offs uh, that are usually off camera. And uh, so all the way on the left, I was having some, some real challenges with uh, that upper tension. Again, on these Japanese machines like the Kenmore's, the, uh, the upper tension unit is a little bit more complicated to, uh, to set it up and to calibrate it and to get it working in concert with that bobbin case below so we get a nice balanced stitch. So you can see initially when I did that first sew off on the far left, it was way out of whack. You can actually see the knots right on top. And, uh, and that's telling you what, type it in the chat. If we're seeing the knots on top of the material, what does that tell us about the balance between the upper tension unit and the bobbin case below? Who's winning the battle and how do we fix it? Type that in the chat if you would. While you're doing that, I'm going to get a quick drink. Okay, you probably have had enough time to type it into the, uh, the, uh, the chat. So if you type something to the effect of, the problem right now, Scott, is that the bobbin case is losing the battle. The upper tension unit, which is this unit right there, that unit right there is being a bully and is pulling up so hard that it is 
throwing off the pull down of that bobbin case. And the result is we're getting an imbalanced stitch. So we can do one of two things. We can either increase the bobbin case pull by turning that screw on it clockwise in very small increments and then doing a sew off, turning it a little bit further, doing a sew off, kind of like you see I did here. I went through how many sew offs before I finally nailed the page 34 on the far right. One, two, three, four, five, six. And on the seventh sew off, I finally got the stitch that I was looking for. I probably could have done it a little bit quicker, but again, I'm sewing with 100% silk thread on protected full grain leather. That's what, that's what we sewed this on. So when you're sewing with silk thread and you're sewing on protected full grain leather, it might take a couple of additional steps to really zero in on that perfect balance. And uh, it took me a little bit extra time, which is cool because we finally nailed it on the end. So, you know, the key when you're when you're trying to balance that that stitch is if you can manage it by manipulating the upper tension. So, let's say your upper tension hypothetically can go all the way up to 9 and when you're struggling with getting a defined top stitch like we are on the far left here for the, about the first four or five sew offs you know, on the fourth sew off from the left, we started to get a little bit more definition, but it still wasn't there yet, 100%. Sometimes you can resolve that. If, you're, if your upper tension is all the way up, you know, let's say on seven or eight and has a max of nine, then you might be able to balance this out by just backing that upper tension off and going from seven, say, down to five. And then you'll see this start to tighten up you'll see it starting to tight up, tighten it up and really come into form. But if your upper tension is all the way down on, say, three or four, you're not going to have enough range to back off that upper tension to bring this into form. You're going to have to pull out that bobbin case and you're going to have to, in small increments, turn that tension band screw clockwise in about one to one and a half millimeter increments up until you see it come into form and then you don't have to mess around with trying to uh, you know manipulate the upper tension when you have no range to work with again if you're if you're on three or four you got no range to work with if you're on seven or eight and your max is nine you might be able to back it off to five like I said and then get this into beautiful form in this instance I had to do adjustments top and bottom to bring it into form and again, when you go through different materials, you might have to tweak it a little bit, especially working with silk thread. So during this premiere, we might have to do that. But it, isn't it exciting to see the progression from left to right with that stitch coming beautifully uh, into form and starting really to look like it's supposed to look? Yeah, I think I'm going to be battling this computer because it keeps going into sleep mode and then the music stops. Bah! Silly thing. I'll have to, I'm not going to do it now, but I'll have to change the sleep setting mode on this computer so that it doesn't keep doing that. I had that. I remember the other computer was doing that for a while too. But at any rate, I'll move this out of the way. I just wanted to show you that when I get done with all of my work on the machine, that's really the first time that I'm putting material underneath that presser foot and then I start to fine-tune it to get it just spot on. Actually, you know what I do? I'll put this underneath the, uh, the needle real quick because I think before I forget to do it, because I might forget to do it, uh, we'll go ahead and I'll show you that hack for the uh, bobbin winder uh, right now before we jump into other things. Let me come out a little bit further. You can see that right about, that should be pretty good right about there, I think. And I'm gonna be winding it with the thread that the customer provided, which is kind of a generic, uh, what is this? It's a generic Coates and Clark all-purpose thread. All-purpose threads are not the greatest quality, and I will give that feedback to uh, Penny to pass along to her sister. This is like a super low-grade thread 
similar to, and not to beat up Walmart, but it's going to be a low-grade thread similar to this thread that Walmart sells right here. And this is an all-purpose Coates and Clark uh, type thread. Both of these are not going to be premium threads. They're not going to be Guterman level. They're not even going to be tri lobal level like you've seen me use multiple times on the machines. So uh, you know, just realize if you're using a lower grade thread like this, it'll impact the stitch quality. So that's why I elected not to go with either of these threads on this Japanese clone machine. Japanese clone machines get a lot of criticism already, and I want to set this machine up to be as successful as possible. But for purposes of winding a bobbin, we can certainly do that. So I'll use her thread to do that. And I'll just have some music softly in the background as long as it decides to play. Which it may not last long. I may be battling that thing for a while. Okay, so as we're looking at the machine, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to disengage the clutch. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? Unless you're brand, 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 brand new to uh, sewing, you disengage a clutch by rotating this stop action towards you, and then uh, it basically takes out the retainer that presses into the main shaft, and then only the balance wheel uh, will turn for bobbin winding. Because in most instances, when you're winding a bobbin, you're going to have the machine threaded up, and you don't want to have that needle moving unless you have material underneath it. So I've turned that towards me to disengage it. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this bobbin, which I realize now has thread on it already. So I'm going to take all that thread off. It's kind of a travesty, isn't it? Let me see if I can get another class 15 just to wind. Let me see if I, I should have an extra class 15 over here somewhere. And there are different styles of class 15s, just so you know that. So I'll see if this will mount properly on Penny's sister's machine. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. But I've shown that to you in other premieres. There are different styles of class 15. So just be aware of that sometimes the, the pin alignment, because it's an aftermarket, is off a little bit. And when you try to mount it onto here, it's going to have a little wobble to it. It's really frustrating. So just be aware of that if you're trying to battle that. Now here we've got our tensioner. I'm just going to point at it down here at the bottom. I think you can see that in the shot. Let me give you a little tip on that as well, and I'll zoom in on it also. So this little tensioner down here is really going to be your steering wheel to uh, get that thread evenly distributed as it's going onto the bobbin. Think of it almost like that car that you had one time where during the winter time or otherwise you, you ended up bumping the curb and then every time after that when you're trying to go straight down the road instead of the wheel being perfectly straight it's slightly off to the left or slightly off to the right. Have you ever had a car like that where you bump the curb and then all of a sudden the alignment of that steering wheel, wheel is not with the wheel base of the car? You know what I'm saying? I think you know what I'm saying, especially if you're in a colder climate and you slide into a curb or something like that. All of a sudden, it, it just bothers the heck out of you because you want that steering wheel to be straight when you're going straight down the road. Well, what this does is there's a little screw on the back side of it you can loosen and then you can slide this in that little track you can see uh, to the right of it. You can slide it left or right. Why would you do that? Why would you slide this left or right uh, on a machine when you're trying to do a bobbin wind. Go ahead and type it in the chat what you think. Or what would you be what would you be trying to achieve by sliding it to the left or right? I, I don't know if I'm asking the question well. What is it gonna do? That's really the, the ultimate question that I'm looking to try to get an answer to. What is this gonna do uh, in the process of winding a bobbin when you slide this left or right? Type it in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds and I'll get another drink of water. And I didn't ring the bell, but we had fire alarms and everything else at the beginning of this, so consider that the classroom bell. 
when that lady bumped her knee at whatever that toy store was. Remember that? That was pretty interesting. Hopefully she's okay. Yeah. Okay, you've had enough time. So if you start to wind a bobbin and you notice as the thread is going back and forth and being distributed onto the bobbin itself, as the thread is being distributed onto the bobbin, you notice that there's a heavier concentration of thread building up on the left side and you're watching it closely and, and so you stop. You obviously stop because you don't want to have an unevenly wound bobbin. So if it's building up on the left side, that means that we need to loosen that screw down here and we need to slide this to the right. Not all the way to the right, but slide it over to the right, you know, a good couple of millimeters. So that then when, that, when you resume winding that bobbin, that thread is going to be automatically shifting its emphasis from the left where it was heavily concentrated more to the right. Now, if you start to wind it again and okay, it's better, it's now starting to move further over, but it's still not evening out. Then you have to go down there and loosen this again, slide it a little bit further to the right, tighten it down, obviously, and then resume your bobbin winding. And that generally will accomplish it where then you'll notice that the thread is being distributed evenly all the way from the left to the right, back and forth and back and forth. And it's, it's, it's laying down beautifully. So that's the whole point of this tensioner down here is like a steering wheel to set that steering wheel at the appropriate position so that that thread when it's being put onto the bobbin is being laid down evenly left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. And the computer went into the sleep mode again and now it's saying, no, I don't want to play any music because I'm off duty. Yeah, I'll give you off duty. I'll give you off duty, you lazy computer. Probably just will resume automatically once I take it, tap that little screen, so. Yeah. All right, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. All right, we're just going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to worry about it. I'll fix it after this premiere. So moving forward, it'll be happy. It'll be happy. All right, so let's set, set this up to wind a bobbin now. We're obviously going to bring the thread from the spool, which we eventually will put on the spool pin over there. And there's my phone again. Gumdrops. All right, let me fix this real quick. Someone is really, really determined to get me right now. They are having a sewing machine emergency, and uh, they are not going to take voicemail as the final answer. Nope, not going to do it. All right. Well, now they'll have to take it because I won't be able to hear it ringing, and I won't feel guilty. Maybe a little. Okay, so we're taking this thread now, we're bringing it behind the disc. This disc again is going to have a little spring on there that creates that natural tension. Going to bring it up through there, put this actually on the spool over there. And then you're going to take this up to your bobbin. And it's kind of awkward to try to wind it on there when you're in that position. So I usually just kind of cheat and I take it off. And you can't see that right now because of the angle. There, now you can see it. So I usually just take it off and you know, there's different camps of thought. Do you wind it forward? Do you wind it back? I've tried both. Sometimes one works great. Sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of like the weather. It's not necessarily perfect. So I'm going to wind it towards me. Then I'll put it back on that bobbin winding mounting point. Rotate the uh, wheel so I can feel that pin slide into one of the holes. Hold my little thread here as best as I can. Depress this to engage the bobbin winder. And well, let's get the bobbin on there first. There we go. Now I got it. 
Okay, now we're going to engage the bobbin winder. Heard it kind of click into place. This is called bobbin winding music. Maybe. All right, so hold your little thread that is extended out. Go ahead and engage your foot controller. And it went off. Hold on a second. This happened to that other Premier too. Silly thing, you. Apparently I wasn't holding the thread tight enough. Alright, we almost got it. Take up my thread slack a little bit. That was exhausting. Winding a bobbin shouldn't be that difficult. Sometimes it is when you're on camera. <laughs> All right, let's get closer. And I'll show you kind of what we're doing and what it's doing. And if you've never been in theater or live productions, and you have no idea why things tend to go wrong when you're trying to wind a bobbin. All right, so from right here, we're going to kind of watch this wind. I usually put my finger just on top of here, just so it's not spinning and hopping all over the place. And we'll watch and see how it's laying down that thread as far as the evenness of it. All right, now I'll come a little bit closer like that. There we go, I don't have to get as close. All right. See how nice and even that is? And it wasn't like that when I got the machine. I had to make adjustments to this to get that thread so that it was spot on as far as laying down an even flow. But eventually we're going to encounter a problem and then I'll show you how to bypass it. We're going to get to a certain fill point and then it's going to stop. It's going to disengage. And you can see this is my bob and I think this is an aftermarket one. See how it's it got a little bit of a wobble to it? That's because it's not a super high quality bobbin. Some of them are made, some of them are not made so well. It's a cheaper gauge metal. We're getting pretty close to the maximum. Again, this is built in to this type of bobbin winding assembly. It's built in. It's going to eventually get to a fill point. It's going to say enough is enough. But we're not even going to be close to having a full bobbin. See that? That's how far we got right there. Not horrible, but not really great either. So all you have to do is manually we're going to be pushing this back down again and kind of holding it into place pushing on this right here as a bypass so i'm holding that in so it can't kick out on me and i'm going to keep on filling it beyond the point it said that i could by holding this down see how i'm holding that down and now we're at max see that i'd say i'd say most people consider that to be full all we did is get to that fill point where it said, okay, no more. And then we just hold this in and it allows us to continue to fill that bobbin to a nice full point. So that's what I'm going to recommend that Penny's uh, sister do uh, so that she can enjoy the fuller bobbins. You can see right now, we try to engage it to lock it in place. It's got a built-in default. It's not going to let us do that. But we can manually hold this in and bypass that point. See that? All right, so that's another little quick little hack for you. Now we have a nice full bobbin for Penny's sister to put to work. Also, you can see in the shot right now, that little hole, see that little hole? That's a lubrication point. So periodically, 
depending on how often you're winding bobbins, you want to put a drop of oil in that hole and then just rotate this so that that shaft that's running through, the shaft that you can see kind of sticking out here, has nice lubrication and it's turning free and turning true. Yeah. All right, there you go. We wound a bobbin. Hey! Initially, I was, it was kind of rocky. We were like, I don't know if Scott's going to get this or not, but we didn't give up. We didn't give up. Yeah. All right, let me plug the camera back in. There we go. Yes, my computer went into sleep mode again. This computer is in the sleep mode. It's a sleeping. Give me just a second, you guys. I'm going to see if I can win this battle now. <laughs> that was fun. And right now I'm not seeing the setting so I'm not used to Windows 10 yet uh, Windows 10 is very foreign to me all right I'll goof around with this after I don't want you guys to have to wait around and go hey, I don't know. Well. all right well after all of this intro why don't we actually sew something with this machine yes it actually sews but we have to do a couple other things first before I forget Hold on. Turn your uh, stop action away from you. Lock it in place. All right, let's go down to the needle now and actually stitch with this machine. kind of can see in the shot there <clears throat> really the last one two the last two rows when I was fine-tuning that uh, that tension balance the last two rows were pretty good but if you look at the second to the last row it still wasn't there yet yeah all right I'm distracted a little And again, when you're using silk thread, it'll kind of throw debris all over the place. If the presser foot looks dirty, it is. It's from the sew-offs I've done already. All right, let's give this a go. What I will redo, first of all, is I will re-sew a stitch line on this protective full grain leather just to make sure when I had the face plate open and everything that I didn't goof anything up. And again, always launch with your take-up arm at the highest position, right? Always launch with your take-up arm at the highest position. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So again, when you're lifting that pressure for lever in the back, I clicked it up one position, but that tension is not released, so I have to push it up a little bit higher, remember that. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful stitch. Beautiful, beautiful stitch. <clears throat> we'll lay down a zigzag next to it as well. Very, very nice. Well, 
let me get this back into place and then I'll show you how we lock in that uh, zigzag because remember this zigzag knob that I showed you it looks like a radio knob has a spring in it so it's constantly going to be unless the boundary is set it's constantly going to be pulling back to a zero position so look at what we sewed through right there kind of from the side it's about four ounces of protected full grain leather it's really really thick stuff really tough look at the back as well there's our nap so not a light sew off by any stretch of the imagination again we're sewing with uh, silk thread but look at that stitch we laid down absolutely spot on absolutely spot on all right let's lay down a zigzag next to it and I'll show you how you need to kind of do that you gotta it's a little tricky unless you want to hold on to that knob the whole time which I do not I do not want I do not want to do that Sam I am that's a little bit dirty right there hold on a second turn I'll bet you I had the clean side pointing out but I I just forgot to get in that little space right there and get the rest of that off again if you go to a sewing shop they're not gonna give a hoot if your parameter controller is dirty they're not gonna care I do yeah it was a little bit dirty can you kind of see that in the shot I think you can get the screen pointing around the wrong way Okay, so again, this is spring-loaded. When I let it go, you see that? It's always going to go back to zero. So if we say, well, I want to do a zigzag down this protected full-grain leather. Let's do like a three. How do we get it to stay? Well, you get it to the three position right there. And you screw in this left one to set a bottom boundary. Now it's going to stay in place right on three until we turn this clock, counterclockwise and release that mechanism again to go back to zero. And now we've set three as the low boundary. We can always manipulate this and go between three and five now. See that? Or let's say we wanted to go between three and four. Then we could take this up to four and we can lock this right one in here and then it's going to go only between three and four. Four will be our top boundary. So now if we push on this, we can't get up to five. We can only go like this. See that? So if you were wanting to create your own zigzag pattern and you wanted a variant between three and four as you're sewing, you could be the equivalent of that 130-6 embroidery kit manipulating that stitch, right? <clears throat> but I really don't care about the upper boundary to be honest with you I'm just going to go with the three leave it right there and we'll stitch that that way my stitch length right now is on five I'm going to bring that down to three as well I think you can see, can you see that when I adjusted that? No, you can't, it's off, it's off camera. Yeah, it's pretty much on camera, sort of. Well, no, it isn't, there it is. Let's come right to there. All right, I'm just gonna leave it like that for right now. Let's just leave it like that for right now. <clears throat> So what I did with this controller is you can turn it like this, like a radio or TV knob. It was all the way up on five. I just brought it down to three. Because when I do zigzags, I like them to be balanced between the stitch length and width. So if I'm doing a stitch width of three like I am up here, then I'm going to set this on three as well, just to see what that, that stitch is going to look like. 
The other thing I'll tell you about these Japanese clone machines is depending on the thread setup and the needle setup you have, you might have to, when you initially launch, you might have to hold onto that thread in the back. Otherwise, what you'll have is you'll get a little bit of a sew over, like you've seen me do on a couple of machines, where the thread will kind of bunch up on the initial launch and you'll, you'll have to kind of unravel it, you know what I mean? Kind of like you've sewn over the tail of your own thread. So if you hold on to it just initially on the launch, you can avoid that problem most of the time. <laughs> All right, take apart at the highest position. Let me adjust that because right now we're really, really on the low end. And again, you want to have the take up arm so it's just about ready to go on its downstroke so you don't get any binding when you launch, right? All right, here we go. We're going to be sewing a three by three zigzag stitch with Penny's sister's machine. I don't know what Penny's sister's name is. is. Isn't that horrible? I have no idea. So we'll just call her Penny's sister. Yeah. Kind of like on that last premiere, everyone was referring to my Mountie, which I said I was associating with Paula Noel's husband, who is originally French Canadian. And they started saying, what did they start calling him? Type it in the chat what they were calling Paula's husband. Yeah, it was a little bit embarrassing, but whatever. This is fun music. All right, let's launch with this now. Here we go. Press your foot lever all the way up. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Wait until you see this. You can already see it a little bit now. No, you can't. We're way out there. Never mind. <laughs> see that? Low budget. I've got no camera person. <laughs> Mr. Bean is offered, but he always goofs around with it, so... All right, so we've done that. Now I'm going to change this. I'm going to go up to four, and then we'll look at all of these. These three that we just did. Here we go. Okay, so since we have the wide shot right now, I'll show you again. So right now we have it set on three and three, stitch width on three, stitch length on three. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take away my low boundary now. So I'm just gonna turn this little knob here counterclockwise, and then it will release that low boundary. So now it'll drop all the way down to zero, but I can only go up to four still, see that? You can kind of see it, maybe. Yeah, we're a ways out. You can't see it real clearly, but oh well. Uh, zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit more clearly. So I still have the top boundary set right now, so we can only go as high as four, and that's okay. But what I want to do now is I want to lock it on four. So I'm going to take this knob and I'm going to turn it to four because that's what I want to sew next. Right about there. And I want to lock it in on four. So now I'm going to tighten my left boundary, which will hold it at the four position. And then I'm going to release my right boundary so that if I wanted to, I, I'm not necessarily going to do it, but now that I release my right boundary, now I can go between four and five. See? We're just going to stick with four for right now, but I am going to adjust my stitch length and bring that to four as well. So we're going to have a balance of four and four. Okay. <clears throat> Head back down towards the needle. Stop right about there. 
All right, so now we're going to be sewing the zigzag again, but this time we're going to have a, instead of a three by three, we're going to do a four by four. If I take up arm all the way to the highest position, I'm going to go ahead and hold onto that thread in the back so I don't get any of that weird overlay of the thread. And then we're going to launch forward. All right, you ready? Here we go. And I'm going to, I'm going to pause that music for just a moment. Pause that music for just a moment as we do this next sew off. So I, I want you to be able to hear this machine running. It is, it, it's a tank. It's strong. It's very, very strong. All right, here we go. No hesitation, no pause, it just jumps into it like, let's get her done. So I gotta rotate that needle up, and then I can pull my thread out. Get that in place again. Go ahead and clip this as well. And now we'll look at these stitch rows that we did. And this will be a, a challenging one to display. I'm just going to do my best to kind of balance it across the front of the machine, kind of like this. Because it's so doggone long. Super long. So we'll look at the straight stitch, the 3x3 three three zigzag, and then the 4x4 four four zigzag that we did. Some of you might be saying, are we going to do a 5x5 five five zigzag? You never know. We might. We might. And I don't have the perfect angle here because of leaning in against the machine, but I'll do my best to show it to you. And we're just going to focus on the last three rows because those, those are the ones that we sewed during this premiere. Um, all the other ones above it are the ones I was doing when I was fine-tuning the machine. So I want you to look at stitch quality. I want you to look at spacing, stitch integrity, stitch formation, st stitch presentation, the glory of the stitch. And again, realize we don't have the perfect ideal setup. We're, we're sewing with a 9014 Schmetz Universal Needle on protected full grain leather using silk thread. But I still think the, the stitch quality, we're going to nail a page 34, if not a page 34 plus. All right. Right about there, I think it's pretty good. All right, I'm going to start to go across. And I'm seeing at, at interval parts, I'm seeing a little bit of a compression on the uh, the straight stitch. Not so much the zigzag. We're spot on right there. That's a solid page 34 plus. But intermittently, again, remember I, I had a lot of uh, adjustments to do. Let me get my hand off the camera. I had a lot of adjustments to do before I finally felt like we had nailed that tension balance between the upper tension and the bobbin below. But depending on the material I'm sewing, it might be pulling a little bit harder than we want it to be pulling now. And what that will cause is intermittently, you'll see a slight compression of the straight stitch. It won't be as evident with the needle swing stitches on this machine, the, the zigzagging, but it'll be more evident with the straight stitching. So all of that blah, 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 I'll go all the way to the end and go back again. You just kind of look for that compression factor. And it's something we can certainly fix if we wanted to. But right now we're just looking for stitch quality and it's spot on. Also because of the angle of the, the angle of the leather, see the angle of the leather being a little bit weird? We're not gonna get the per perfect uh, vantage point to view these either. Folks, I'm giving that a solid page 34 stitch. Solid page 34 stitch. And then we're kind of looking on the on the edge of it with the leather angled in an odd way. So, but really, really great looking stitching. 
And when we turn it over, I don't think we're going to see anything drastically different with that lock stitch. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. And again, we're talking about four ounces of protected full grain leather. Totality of the stitching, I'll just kind of stop right about there. Because again, I, I want to concentrate on the ones that we actually just sewed on this live premiere. It's not a live stream, but it's a live premiere. Uh, so, very, very happy with that, especially considering the angle of our material is not ideal right now. It's, it's not facing us. It's on, an, it's on an angle, as you can see when I come out on the shot. See that? I'd like to be able to rotate it more so that it's facing us, but I can't do that because of how long this sew-off is. So very, very happy with how it's performed on protected full grain leather. So now let's try some of that Kona cotton that Paula Noel sent me. Let's try some of that Kona cotton. Kind of a tough thing to say, isn't it? Kona cotton. What do you got? I'm sewing Kona cotton, buddy. All right, I'm going to move this protected full grain leather to the back as a a definite pass. We're going to get this Kona cotton into place. And I'm going to take the pin out, uh, even though I know I could leave it in, and I'm going to grab a couple of my little clamps. And I know that Paula gave me some as well, but I've got these right in, right within reach. So Now before we sew this Kona cotton, we might have to do an adjustment. What do you think it is? What might we need to adjust? Right now we're going to get a zigzag, which that's not a, that's not a big deal, getting a zigzag. But we might have to adjust our presser foot pressure, right? Because right now we are set at a level that it's probably pretty good for, for leather sewing, like on that protective full grain leather, but now we're sewing 100% cotton with that uh, that batting in the middle. It's a lot on the lighter side, see that? A lot on the lighter side. And right now this is our adjusted point. So what do we do with that? Do we try it and if it starts to bunch up then we, then we lessen it or should we adjust it a little bit now? Probably gonna adjust it now. So I can see where I'm at right now. That may almost be the same point. I'm gonna to try to feel that. I'm gonna try that right there and see how this material responds to it. Try it right about there. And that's pretty close to where we were. We're on the lighter side right now, which if you had noticed, the fullness of the stitch line that we did with the straight stitching wasn't quite as long as the earlier one that I did when I had that presser foot pressure much higher. And that's what will happen because that presser foot pressure is pushing down on the material with the presser foot attachment against those feed dogs. And if there's not enough pressure, you're not going to get the fullness of that stitch. So you just have to remember to make that adjustment when you're going between the different fields of materials. Most of you won't be doing that like we do during a sewing Olympics. So the first stitch I'm gonna lay down though is a straight stitch, so I need to make some changes over here. I'm gonna loosen my left boundary like you saw me doing before and drop that all the way down to zero. And I'm gonna take my stitch length all the way up to five. All right, let's try this 100% cotton, this 100% Kona cotton that Paula Noel sent right after I wipe off my glasses. Hold on a second. Now 
Okay, let's give this a go. Oh, not yet. Take up arm at the highest position. Almost forgot. All right, here we go. Two layers of Kona cotton uh, with a batting in between the two layers, kind of like we were, we were making a quilt. All right, here we go. So, uh, not really, we didn't really get much in the way of bunching. It started to act like it might have an issue, but then it just went through straight away. And this color is going to be really, really hard to see on this material. It's going to be really hard to see. I'm going to execute some zigzags because it's going to be a lot easier to see with this light Kona cotton against this greenish thread. I want us to be able to see that stitching. So we're going to lay down a zigzag next to this. So right now it's a little bit hard to, I'm going to look under magnification and see. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. It's just hard as heck to see it. We might have gotten just a little bit of bunching towards the end, so I'm going to lighten this up a little bit more, the presser foot pressure. There we go. Hopefully I didn't lighten it too much. I'm going to try this saw off again, laying down a zigzag next to it. And we'll try to zoom in on these so we can see it, but it's going to be a little bit tough. All right, there we got that down. Yeah, I hope I didn't make that presser foot pressure too light. All right, so now I'm going to set the zigzag. And I'm just going to show you again so that repetition is the key to learning, right? Yeah, you can see that from the edge. Good looking stitching. Very, very nice. Easier to see it from an angle. Yeah, beautiful. All right. So now we're going to set it for a zigzag. We're probably going to do the three, depending on how much room we have, I'm going to be doing the three and uh, the three by three and the four by four again. Come up to right about there. So I'm just again I'm going to turn this to the point that I want it to be stitching at. So I'm going to put it right on the three and then I'm going to lock my left boundary so that it stays in place. Right now I don't have any right boundary so I could go between three and five just like that. But we're just going to sew it at three and then I've got to adjust my stitch length over here down to three uh, just like we did before. Yeah, that's pretty. There we go. So we've, we've got three and three, so a three by three. Now let's go down to the needle and we'll stitch this off. So I'll just show you again real quick. We've got that set on three and we have this the radio dial set right around on three. It looks like it's higher than three, but it really isn't. It's just the angle, kind of like when we were looking at the stitching on that protected full grain leather and we had it not at the perfect angle. Yeah. All right, let's come down here. Kind of lock that in eventually. Good, there we go, stay, be good. All right, let's do this zigzag now. Get my take-up arm at the highest position, and we'll launch into this zigzag next. Again, it's a three by three zigzag. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is I'm probably, well, I was gonna adjust the material over just a little bit, because I think we're too far to the right. Hold on a second. And again, I did lighten up the presser foot pressure just a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to do a hold on those threads. 
And this is our three by three zigzag that we're doing first. Oh, hold on a second. I need to clip the threads down here. All right, here we go. Yeah, I think that was a that was a good decision to lighten up that presser foot pressure just a little bit more. Because I didn't notice at on this saw off, I didn't notice any of that bunching that we started to get a little bit of uh, before. And you can see the quality of the stitching that we just laid down right there. Absolutely spot on. Beautiful stitching. Okay, now without further ado, we're gonna go and do the four by four. we're going to do a four by four after I clip the threads on both sides and then we'll take a look take a look at these stitches on this 100% uh, uh, Kona cotton so I'm going to get this into position I think we can probably take our clips off at this point I'm thinking we can I believe it's not a mistake yeah I think I can skirt by them we'll leave it so now we did a three by three, and that's a three on, we'll just take a look at those real quick since we're right here. Hold on a second, I gotta loosen the camera. Beautiful stitching, very, very nice. Okay, so back up over here again. And I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence. I just know that repetition is the key. So I just want to make sure that it's absolutely clear how you do this. So right now, our, if we wanted to, say, do a 2x2, two two, we'd have to loosen the left one, right? So we could drop down to 2. But we still have to loosen it because we want to go up to 4 now. And unless I want to hold on to this, because if I, if I don't loosen the left one and set that new boundary for the drop down... It's going to go right back down to three again. So I've got to put it on four, loosen this, and then tighten it back up again to lock it in on four. Okay? So now we're set on four. Now I need to adjust this to four. And now we're going to stitch off a four by four zigzag. Stitch width four, stitch length four. All right, so let's go down here. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good spot right there, I think. Okay, so a 4x4 four four now. Get my take-up arm at the highest position. And I'll just hold onto that thread initially at launch. All right, here we go. And I'm holding that power way back. This machine has a lot of get up and go, a lot of get up and go. Perfect. All right. Draw that all the way out. Clip the thread. Take our clips off finally. And we'll get this set up so we can take a peek at it. And I'm going to, the my regular stitch off holder that Maddie sent me is a little bit more accessible, so I'm going to use that right now rather than the cool one that uh, Paula sent me. So we'll look at the top stitch first. Again, we've got two layers of Kona 100% cotton. And uh, we've got uh, quilt batting in the middle of it. All right, I think that angle is okay. Let's zoom in on it and take a look. It's definitely going to be better than that long piece of uh, protected full grain leather that I was trying to show you before. That's for darn sure. 
All right, so we'll we'll kind of center ourselves on. I guess we could look at all three rows, but I'll, I'll center us on the two top two rows, and then we'll look at that bottom row last. Folks, I am looking at. Let me get my hand off the camera. I am looking at some gorgeous stitching there. I don't know what you can see, but this 100% Kona cotton, it just really it accentuates uh, the beauty of a stitch, even though our setup is not ideal. Again, a 9014 universal Schmetz needle and Guterman 100% silk thread, it's still going to give us a real, real nice product in the end. Let's go across and take a look. Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Again, I, I'm almost inclined to think that our bobbin pull might be on a little bit on the heavier side right now, but it's still giving us a real nice stitch. If I wanted to fine tune it though, I probably would back off that bobbin a little bit, or I would just increase that upper tension slightly. I'll actually do that when I go back to the machine. Folks, that's a solid page 34 stitch. Let me pause right there. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. Drop down to that last row we did of that uh, 4x4 zigzag. We'll look at both zigzags next to each other. It does not get any better than that. That is a drop dead gorgeous, 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 gorgeous zigzag. The 3x3 and the 4x4 are absolutely spot on. Let's look at all three rows. Beautiful stitching. Totality of the stitching. Kind of come out to, that's probably too far. Totality. Totality of the stitch, I'm going to take my hand off the camera. Totality of stitching is absolutely spot on, but we're always committed to constant and never ending improvement, right? The only way that I think we can improve this a little bit more is to probably be using a suitable needle like an embroidery needle. That would even give us a better product on this material, this 100% Kona cotton. And I think we would probably bump up that upper tension a little bit because I think we're getting a little bit too much pull down now. From that bobbin case. Originally the upper tension was bullying the bobbin case and now the bobbin case if you really scrutinize the stitch they're all gorgeous stitches but if you really scrutinize the stitch intermittently you're seeing a little bit of a flex on the part of that bobbin case where it's muscling a little bit too much uh, against that upper tension. It's doing a little bit too much muscling and if Bill is watching this right now Bill that's your organ playing buddy yeah, so really happy with that. I'm going to come out, we'll flip it over and look at that lock stitch. This is our lock stitch now. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to bump up that upper tension just slightly. Take the edge off of that bobbin case being a bully. All right, so totality of the stitching. Again, we're looking at the lock stitch now. Lock stitch is always more difficult to produce, and yet when a machine is running at the top of its game after it's gotten a dose of the workshop magic, you're gonna see a very sexy lock stitch. Let's, let's zoom in and take a look at that. And a sexy three by three zigzag. Beautiful. Absolutely fantastic. Let's drop down and look at the two zigzag rows. The top row again is a 3x3, three three, the bottom row is a 4x4. Four four. Folks, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, the formation of the stitch and the execution of the stitch, it's just absolutely bang on. I would give these a solid page 34 plus.
absolutely gorgeous. So totality of the stitching come up to about right about there. Get my hand off the camera. I could not be any happier. And again, my thanks to Paula Noel for uh, putting together these little groupings of this Kona 100% cotton with the quilt batting. It really does give you an appreciation for the beauty of what a machine is doing down at the needle. Whether it's a Japanese clone like this, which some people just adore Japanese clones. Others, I'll just be honest with you, there are some hate camps out there for Japanese clone machines. Uh, they just hate them. Uh, and they hate them even more when they look at stitching like this that Penny's sister's machine is laying down. And it was not coming anywhere near to stitching like this when I initially sat down to the machine. Matter of fact, I can show you what it was doing. This is what it's doing now. And I know it's a different material, it's a different setup, I get that. But this is what we were getting on denim prior to the machine going through the magic of the workshop. The black thread is kind of what we're looking at there. Not too good, is it? That compared to the one that just fell on the ground. That's what it is. Hold on a second. <laughs> la, 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 la. Compared to this. Stuff is so lightweight, it's like, okay. So, this. This compared to this. Hey, that's what I wanted to show you. Hey. All right. I'm going to throw that to the back, and I'll leave uh, some of this space open so that Penny's sister can uh, try out this 100% uh, cotton, uh, Kona cotton. So I'm going to throw that to the back as well. All right. Now I'm going to stand back up again. Hey! This guy's really jamming on the organ, isn't he? All right. What else are we going to sew? And i got to be mindful of the time as well. This is this customer showing up very soon. Very, very soon. Why don't we stitch? What do I have? I've got some of this Italian leather. This Italian leather is really, really tough stuff. I don't know if I should try two layers of Italian leather, considering I'm using silk thread, but I might give it a go just for fun. See what I can do with it. I did not test this off camera, so we'll do them back to back. I know the machine is strong enough to do it, but I don't know if we'll buzz down and trying to do a four by four zigzag. But I, ugh, I don't know. If it doesn't work, then I'll go to a single layer, and that's fine. All right, so just a short little run. Two layers of Italian leather, uh, back to back. Matter of fact, let me line them up so that they're more lined up so we have a clear edge to look at the thickness. There we go. I'll line it like this and then we'll go through it. And we're gonna be laying down a zigzag on it, needle swing going through this very, very thick Italian leather. So, I, like I said, I didn't test this, so we'll have to wait and see what happens. Have to wait and see what happens and I might give it a little bit of a hand start just because I don't want that belt to slip when a belt slips it does damage to the belt so I'll give this a try we'll see what happens here we go oh you know what I didn't do <laughs> you know what I didn't do we got a great looking stitch amazingly through all of that leather look at the thickness of what we just sewed but I forgot to increase the presser foot pressure and I could tell straight away with the way it was launching. I could tell straight away. We're not gonna change a thing other than increase the pressure with pressure. We're gonna sew down it one more time. These two layers of Italian leather, look at the thickness of that. And with increased presser foot pressure, you're gonna see a drastic difference. Well, maybe not drastic. 
I'm being a little bit melodramatic, but we're going to see a difference in how it's feeding now. So I just bumped up the presser foot pressure. We're going to do the same thing right next to this other stitch line <clears throat> and see what result we get this time, considering we've punched up that uh, presser foot pressure dramatically. All right, here we go. Whoa, hang on, buddy. I kind of went off course a little bit there. Sorry about that. That was kind of weird. Oh, yeah, drastically different. Even though I didn't sew straight, we'll look at these side by side. You can see straight away how different they are. Very, very different. And again, the, the stitch length and everything is identical for both rows. But the first row I did, I had the presser foot pressure too low. It was too low. So you'll notice it looks like the width is, is adjusted, but it's actually the feed. It's a feed factor. I actually don't mind the look of the first one, but that's not what we should have gotten if the presser foot pressure was high enough. All right, let's take a look at these. Again, two layers of Italian leather. So look at the, look at the drastic difference when you, all I did was bump this from the minimum state that it was in about, if you can imagine a 50% higher, to maximizing that presser foot pressure, and we get a product like this. These are exactly the same, these are both four by fours. The stitch width is four, the stitch length was four, but the feed was inadequate on that lower row. And so we got a stubbier, more compressed zigzag. Then I increased it, and apart from not sewing incredibly straight, because the machine got all excited and was like, hey, let's do this. But look at look at the difference. One, one zig stitch on top, if I can say that, one zigzag stitch on top is the equivalent of almost two on the bottom row. Same stitch length, same stitch width. Different presser foot pressure. Do you get it? You get how, how important presser foot pressure is. I talk about it all the time, but when you see an illustration like this, it's evident how setting that presser foot pressure is so critical. Totality. Be beautiful stitching on both rows, but the one on the top row, apart from not being completely straight, uh, is what we should have gotten the first time as well. So there you go. Let's take a look at the lock stitch. So here's our lock stitch, two layers of Italian leather. Once again, the top row is when we increase the presser foot pressure. The bottom row is when we had the presser foot pressure. And I'm noticing something straight away. Again, we're sewing with a non-leather needle. We're using silk thread. But what I'm seeing is we got a much fuller stitch on top when we increase that presser foot pressure, but I'm also seeing that our upper tension to manage this much leather is inadequate. Do you see the knot? Instead of that knot being centered on those two layers of Italian leather, which is a ridiculous thickness, it's a little bit closer to the bottom, which means our bobbin was pulling down harder than our upper tension and the result is we did not get that knot right in the middle. We didn't get that knot right in the middle. So that's something else that we would have to adjust if we were going to be sewing a ton of this Italian leather with two, two thicknesses. We would have to bump that upper tension up a little bit to pull that knot up a little bit further so that we would get an even balance between the two. But even with that little bit of not a lot, not anomaly, not anom try saying that fast, not anomaly, we got beautiful stitching on both rows, but we have a little bit of a tension tweak that we would need to do if we were sewing with this setup at this level. Again, a non-leather needle, a universal needle, size 9014 with silk thread. Totality of the stitching, very impressed, very, very impressed 
at what we got apart from that little tension tweak that we would want to do. But again, let me show you from the side what we just sewed so you can appreciate it. Can you see that in the shot? I hope you can. I'm going to turn the camera screen around. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. There we go. That's what we just sewed with silk thread, folks. So if anyone says to you, you, you can't sew leather with silk thread, please share this premiere of Penny's Japanese clone machine doing it. And the only thing that I, you know, the only criticism I would make of myself, not the machine, is if I'm going to be doing this all day long, if I'm going to be doing, you know, purses or gloves or gun holsters or whatever with two layers of Italian leather, that thick, probably about eight to ten ounces of thickness, probably about four or five millimeters thick, I'm going to have to bump that upper tension up a little bit because I always say it, don't I? I always say it. It's always more difficult to execute a spot-on lock stitch because you're fighting gravity, you're fighting the, the toughness of that leather and pulling that thread from the bottom all the way back up through those two very thick layers of Italian leather. And in this instance, we almost nailed it, but we just had a little bit of inadequate upper tension to, to see it through. But it's such an easy fix. We know exactly what we would want to do if we were making a product with this leather thickness all day long. We would just bump that upper tension up, we would keep a sharp needle, and we could use silk to sew leather at this level all day long. All day long we could do it. Just maintaining the machine with a sharp needle, basic lubrication, and because this machine is built like a tank, it could do it all day long. That's an impressive sew-off, folks. That's an impressive sew-off with a gorgeous top stitch and a gorgeous lock stitch that just needs a little bit more, a little bit more upper tension. Beautiful stitching. Look at the thickness. Beautiful stitching. Very impressed. Very impressed. I did not test that off camera. I had no idea what was going to happen. I kind of, I kind of knew, but not really 100% because I, I, I just like being honest with you guys. <clears throat> That's a crazy sew-off. That is a crazy sew-off. All right, so what we're going to do now is this for fun. Because I've got a lot more leather that I could sew. I do, I do, I do. Even some genuine elk hide. You know i got to do some genuine elk hide, right? You know i got to do it. You know i got to do it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this from a 4x4 four all the way down to a two by two zigzag. And then we're gonna go around this genuine elk hide. Where am I? All right, let's go down to a two by two. And then I, almost, I was gonna jump into this bubble gum material, and we will. That'll be our last sew off, but I'm gonna do this setup right now. So I'm gonna loosen this lower one so I can drop down. Now I'm all the way down to zero. I'm going to take it up to two, and then I'm going to lock in that lower left one to hold it in place. And then I'm going to adjust my stitch length from where it was on four all the way down to two. Okay, perfect. And what I'm going to attempt to do, I don't know if I'll be successful or not, I hope I am, but I'm going to try to, this irregularly shaped elk hide, the way I cut it out, it's just a weird shape. I'm going to try to go all the way around the edge as best as I can. Because while this is a, a strong tank-like machine, it also is a machine that you can harness the power on. So I'm going to do my best to try to harness the power. Probably won't be perfect, but that's okay. All right, needles at the highest position. It's all the way underneath the presser foot. All right, so I'm gonna zoom in on this now a little bit closer and you can watch me attempt to lay down this two by two zigzag. So again, we set our stitch length on two. We set our stitch width on two. And now we're gonna to try to go around this material. Right about to there, I think will be a good distance for you to observe me attempting to do this. Yeah. 
Again, it doesn't have to be perfect to be wonderful, just like Paula's so off holder tells us. Yeah. All right, and this is perfect music to attempt this. All right, take up arm is at the highest position. <clears throat> All right, let's give this a go. over my threads. Let me clip these real quick so I don't sew over them. I'm going to stop right there. Otherwise, I'll probably have a nervous breakdown. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that is a little bit nerve-wracking when you're trying to harness a machine power back like that and uh, maneuver around a, a piece of irregularly cut genuine elk hide like that because you need enough power to make it through this material. You just do. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to pierce this. I mean, if you look at it from the side, Actually, we're a ways out, but if you look at it from the side, that is not a thin material. It's 100% elk hide. So you have to have enough power to keep it going, but you have to have enough control to be able to manage those turns and everything. And now you have to have enough. I'm going to have to use one of these clamps to kind of hold it onto this stitch off holder, I think. All right. Well, you'll be able to see the stitching for the most part. At one point it'll kind of disappear. Let's take a look at the, again we did a 2x2 two two zigzag. 2x2. Two two. Alright, we'll start right about up there. Look at that edge, you guys. If you doubt it for a second, the thickness of that elk hide, look at that edge. We're talking, we're almost at the thickness of a man's belt. And we were laying, laying down a two by two zigzag going through it with silk thread. If, that's, if that doesn't impress you, then wow. Look at the consistency of that stitch, the execution of it. It's just absolutely spot on. Unbelievable. Totality of the stitching, I am, I'm impressed. I don't know about y'all, but that is some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. A two by two zigzag going through all of this elk hide, probably about five ounces of elk hide, and it laid down just a gorgeous top stitch. Let's see how it did on that lock stitch now. Let's see how it did on that lock stitch.
All right, I'm hoping, I'm hoping the camera can get all the way in there and see that. Because again, with this light bulb that's in here right now, it doesn't light up the bed real well, it just lights up the needle. But we'll take a look and see if we can see it. I hope we can. And yes, Elkai does have a nap. Kind of come down those two rows at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. Now we're going to follow this trail over here. Incredible, incredible, absolutely spot on. Folks, I am incredibly impressed. Again, we're using a non, let me go right about to there. We're using a non-leather needle. We're using silk thread. And we just went through one of the toughest leathers on earth. One of the toughest leathers on earth, chemically processed 100% genuine elk hide. It's one of the toughest leathers. I, I would rank it above even protected full grain leather, which has a special coating on it to protect it from staining and it galvanizes the surface. This stuff is wicked hard. And yet we just did it with a increasingly tired needle that isn't even designed specifically for leather. It's a universal needle. And we used a thread on it that most people would just shake their heads and say, it can't be done. It can't be done. Sewing genuine elk hide like this, five ounces of leather with 100% Guterman silk thread. You know what? Guterman, if you're watching, which you probably are, I'll go on a live commercial and do this on this machine or another machine using your thread. Because your thread is fabulous. It's fabulous. It really is. I love it. And it does a brilliant job through a wide field of sew-offs that a lot of people would just say, can't be done. Can't be done! We just did it. Again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. So you know what? Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to those folks that say you can't do that. Just do it. Just do it. And have fun sewing, right? Have fun and amaze people. So the elk hide is also a slam dunk. It's absolutely spot on. Top stitch and lock stitch. I'm going to throw that to the back as well. And what we're going to do last now, because I've, I've only got a little tiny little bit of time left. A little tiny little bit of time left. It's probably not really great English, but you know what? Whatever. So I'm going to line up these edges on this bubble gum material. And we're going to lay down a straight stitch and then a series of zigzags from one through five. And I probably don't even need all of this space. I'm quite sure that I don't. But we're going to have the space anyway. So line that up right there. All right. I'm going to check my presser foot pressure. I think it's okay. I might back it off just a little bit. Oh, yeah. This is bubblegum material. This is bubblegum material, song, music, if I ever heard it in my life. Absolutely. All right. So, the first thing I need to do is see where the camera's pointing. Hold on a second. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Let's widen this a little bit. Again, reinforcement through the learning process. This is a classroom. So, the first thing we're going to sew is a straight stitch, right? Right now, we got this locked on two, because that was the last one we did, two by two. I need to grab this, loosen this, let it drop all the way down to zero. I'm also going to loosen this one for now too. So the first thing we're going to do is a straight stitch. I'm going to increase my stitch length all the way to five. My pressure foot pressure, yeah, I've got it really maxed high right now. But this is slippery stuff. I'm going to back it off just a tiny little bit. Just a tiny bit. I think that'll be enough. I, think that, I hope that'll be enough. Might be. There we go. I think that'll be enough. Okay. Straight stitch, and then we're going to do a zigzag, a 1x1, one one, a 2x2, two two, a 3x3, three three, a 4x4, four four, and a 5x5, five five, and that's it. That's the end of the road there, buddies. Buddies, buddies. 
So we have this set on, we have this set on five right now. And we have this set on zero to get a straight stitch. Okay, let's get onto the needle. You know what, let's do this, let's do this. Let's do it right, and I apologize for the distance. Let's do it right here so you can watch me do the other changes. And then I'll show you the stitching at the very end. But you know what, in the meantime, I know that for six, six stitches, we're not gonna need all this material, so I don't wanna waste it. Hold on a second, bear with me. Clamp off, clamp off. I hope I didn't cut it too far. I don't think I did. Clamp on. Clamp on. All right, straight stitch first, and then we'll go through a f the whole cafeteria menu of the zigzags. All right, I'm gonna hold in a thread in the back. Take up arms at the highest position. Let's do this. Here we go. Here goes our straight stitch. And I'm seeing already that we're getting a little bit of compression on, let me check it again. Nope, I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it. I like it. All right, now we're gonna do a, I wish this were a live stream because then I could ask you, do you wanna go biggest to smallest or smallest to biggest? I think we'll go biggest to smallest. Kind of degrade it down. Degradation. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us all the way up to five. I'm going to lock that in. We're going to do a five by five. We're going to do a four by four, a three by three, a two by two, a one by one. All right, so here goes a five by five. Take up arms all the way up. Here we go. Now we're going to do a four by four. back into position. All right, now we're gonna do a four by four. So now I need to reduce this, loosen the left one, lower it down to four, tighten it back up. So now I've got a four, now I need to back this down to four. And now we're gonna lay down a four by four zigzag. Take, a, take up arm all the way to the highest position. And now a four by four, here we go. And yes, I picked Asian music because this machine's place of manufacturing, its inception, its birthplace, was the beautiful country that Umi and her friend call home, the beautiful country of Japan. Now I want those of you that know me quite well and have followed me for a long time, has, ha, has Cow Country, have I ever prepared a machine and shipped it to Japan? Have I, already, have I ever done that? Type in the chat what you think. All right, so we did. A five by five, a four by four, now we're gonna do a three by three. So I need to loosen the left one. Lower this down to three. 
tighten it back up again so it locks on three. Then I'm going to lower our stitch length down to three as well. All right. Now we're going to do a three by three. All right, here we go. You guys are smart. You know we're going to do a two by two next. So the answer is, I don't know if anyone typed it in the chat, but I did prepare a machine that went to Japan, all the way to Japan. I think it's like 8,000 miles or 9,000 miles or something ridiculous like that. And it was for a U.S. service member that was serving in the United States Air Force. And he contacted me and he said, I want to finish restoring this classic car that I had shipped to Japan but I don't have a machine that can do it and they don't sell one at the post exchange that'll do it can you prep me one and I did I prepped him a Viking shipped it all the way to Japan and he finished the restoration on his car I posted that on Facebook but it's been a long time ago so the answer is yes we've even gone all the way to Japan for one of our service members that was serving his country in the United States Air Force. How cool is that? All right, so we did a 5x5, five five, a 4x4, four four, a 3x3. Three three. Now we're going to do a 2x2. Two two. So I'm going to loosen this left one, lower it down to 2, tighten it again so it stays right on 2, lower our stitch length all the way down to 2, and now we're going to do this stitch off as a 2x2, two two. kind of like the arc, 2x2, two two. yeah. And that's me kind of fluttering with the foot controller. It's not the machine having an issue. That's me, I'm kind of like Our other thread. All right, so now we're going to do our last stitch off. It's a one by one, a one by one stitch. One uh, as far as the stitch width, one as far as the stitch length. So I'm going to grab this again, loosen my left one, drop it all the way down to one, tighten it, bring this all the way to one. So you can already envision in your mind what this zigzag is going to look like. It's going to look almost like a mending stitch. It's going to be really tight, and that's okay. Take up arm at the highest position for this final sew off on this amazing Japanese made dressmaker post World War II. All right, you ready? Here we go. Oh, 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 that's oh, that's so cool. That's so teeny. I'm gonna take these clips off. It is so teeny, teeny, tiny. Oh my goodness, gravy. <clears throat> Clip to the rear. March. All right. Let's get this up on a display and take a look at this marathon of stitches we just did. We did a straight stitch, we then did a 5x5 five five zigzag, we then did a 4x4 four four zigzag, a 3x3. Three three. Oh, I just bumped the stitch upper tension there. Oh! We did a 3x3, three three. we did a 2x2, two two. we did a 1x1, one one. and we still have a little bit of extra space where Penny's sister can check this stuff out. Very few people get a chance to touch and sew this amazing bubblegum material. When I run out of it, Show's over. We're done. Hanging up the shingle, baby. <laughs> All right. Let's take out this bubblegum material. Looking at the top stitch first, and then we'll flip it over and look at the lock stitch. So totality of the stitching, folks, that is just really cool. That is so cool! Oh my gosh, I love it. That's just fun. I'm just going to tilt it a little bit more. That is really fun to look at, isn't it? I'm glad we went biggest to smallest. Very cool. 
All right, so let's go in by the, the straight stitch first. Again, this bubblegum material, if, you, if you've never seen me sew it before, then you're brand new, because I've sewn it several times. It's able to cause st skip stitching. It's able to manipulate stitching, distort stitching, mess up stitching, because it's got a high concentration of what? Type it in the chat as I go across and show you this straight stitching. Folks, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Page 34 plus. Oh my gosh, that is a page 34 plus. Wow. Wow! Oh, sorry about that. That is Roz, Paula, Emma. I could name a variety of other folks that just love gorgeous straight stitching not cameras going out of focus folks that is gorgeous it's having trouble there it's, it's saying what do I focus on beyond or in front focus right there folks that's a gorgeous straight stitch look at let's look at these two rows together so that the camera doesn't have as much trouble this is our 5x5 five five zigzag and our straight stitch it doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that. Unbelievable. And again, this stuff is like bubblegum. It's bubblegum material. You could chew it if you were desperate and maybe mentally deranged. But, you know, whatever. So that's our 5x5 five five and our straight stitch. Absolutely page 34+. plus. Let's drop down to the 4x4 four four and the 3x3. Three three. That's what we're looking at right now. Again, the spacing, the integrity of the stitch, the formation of the stitch, the presentation of the stitch, it just doesn't get any better than that. The 4x4 and the 3x3 is spot on. Now let's look at the 3x3 and the 2x2. We're, at, we're kind of looking at all three at the same time there. The 2x2, the 3x3, and the 4x4 on top there. Folks, absolutely drop-dead gorgeous stitching. Absolutely drop-dead gorgeous stitching. And then finally, last but certainly not least, the one by one on the bottom. Is that fun or is that fun? So now we're looking at the, the one by one and the two by two. Wow. Anyone that hates Japanese clone machines, as they're sometimes referred to, is absolutely hating this right now. They're hating it right now. They're hating it. Because look at that field of stitching. Hands off the camera. From the straight stitch on top to the 5x5 five five, to the 4x4, four four, the 3x3, three three, the 2x2, two two, the 1x1. One one. In a partridge, in a pit. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Look at it. It's amazing. It's off the charts as far as textbook near perfect stitching. I never say perfect. Seldom do. Let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch. All right, stay right there, please. Can we have some Japanese music to wrap up this premiere, please? Please, please. Yeah, this is it. So you can already see totality of the stitching on the lock stitch. It's absolutely bang on. We'll zoom in close. Look at that uh, straight stitch and that five by five. Pause. Page 34 plus. Page 34 plus. Page 34 plus. Page 34 plus. All the way across. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And this stuff does have a high concentration of vinyl in it. And nylon. And bubble gum. And everything else. So that was our straight, our 5x5. Five five. Now we're looking at our 4x4 four four and our 3x3. 4x4, 
absolutely amazing. Almost on, almost on the edge of a little bit of over compression there as that upper tension is pulling up probably a touch uh, harder than it needs to. We set it right about there. There's just a slight compression. So subtle is the compression that the average person is not even going to see it. But I know if we were sewing bubblegum material all day long, two layers of this stuff, without using a stiffener in between or, you know, some sort of a batting or something like that to stabilize it, that we would just slightly back off that upper tension a little bit to get a more full, robust lock stitch. But it it's dropped dead gorgeous right now. I'm just being hypercritical. So that's our 3x3, three three, our 2x2, two two, and now we're down to our... Wait, yeah, something like that. Here's our 2x2 two two and our 1x1. One one. What, what can I say? It's exactly as it should be. Totality of the stitching right there, hand off the camera. Folks, if you came into this premiere saying, Japanese clone machines are junk. They're a, they're a cheap knockoff. They were done cheaply in Japan and they were imported in the US and I would never buy that piece of junk. Never buy it. Uh, wow, you're kind of rethinking things now, aren't you? You're kind of rethinking things as far as the quality of engineering that the Japanese poured into these machines. Yes, they had patents and designs from the US, but they could have cut corners and yet they didn't. They wanted to make a product that they could proudly badge mark made in Japan. Like I said, originally it was right on the front of the machine. And then because of people still being bitter about the war, they moved it to the back and they moved it to the center of the pillar so it was out of view. And then they tucked it on the side of the pillar. But the final result is they made a machine that they, they can be that Umi. That Umi can be proud of, that her friend wherever she is. Where'd she go? Oh my gosh, she's so small. No offense. Look at you. I mean, look at... Tall! Less tall! Okay, you're fun size. I get it! Yes, I said fun size, Singer Repair Man. Sorry. So these ladies can be incredibly proud of this Japanese-made machine. And Penny and her sister can be incredibly proud of this Japanese clone machine. This Japanese-engineered masterpiece. I'm going to say it. Japanese engineered masterpiece. Laying down stitching like this. We sewed everything from Italian leather, two layers of it, to elk hide, to uh, protected full grain leather, to Kona, 100% cotton, to bubble gum material. And this Japanese masterpiece did not miss a beat. It didn't miss a beat. So if you were already coming into this premiere as a fan of Japanese clone machines, as some of my friends posted on the Cow Country Facebook page when I was sharing all of the progress shots. You know what? You're even more of a fan now, aren't you? You're even more of a fan because you're like, oh my goodness gravy, that machine knocked it out of the park. It knocked it out of the park. So you know what? I'm not even going to go into the progress shots because you can already see how this machine is sewing now. And I showed you that other sew off that the customer did how poorly it was executing stitching then. It's now kicking it right to the curb and saying, no challenge. Whether it's a lock stitch or the top stitch, it's absolutely off the charts. So we're gonna end this premiere here. I'm gonna show you kind of what we sewed and lay it down on the bed. Turn the camera around so I can see that we're actually seeing something here right about to there it's perfect okay so both on camera and off camera i did this protected full grain leather this huge piece and this machine did a phenomenal job executing page 34 stitching i then on camera did two layers of italian leather about 10 ounces of leather no problem enough power and yet still lay down gorgeous stitching and when i increased the presser foot pressure to accommodate this thicker leather it showed you the fullness of that zigzag i then then did this uh, kona 
100% cotton material with a uh, with a batting in between and it laid down stitching that's absolutely brag worthy. We did this elk hide and I stitched all the way around this really unusually shaped cutout. I don't know what I was thinking, but at any rate, I did it. And it showed the control of this machine as well. It's got a lot of muscle, but you can harness that muscle back. And then finally, this bubble gum material laid down gorgeous straight stitching and then laid down a zigzag that was 5x5, five 4x4, by 3x3, five, 2x2, by three by three, two by two, and 1x1. One one. And it absolutely, wow, wow, amazing. So we're going to end the premiere here. And what I'm going to ask you to please do, please, 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 double please, with sugar on top, please check out the links that are in the description that you'll be able to follow to the Facebook post I did with all of the progress shots, which included fixing a repair that someone else would never have found in the foot controller that could have seriously injured Penny's sister or could have caused a fire. You got to check them out. Okay? So thank you again for falling in love with a Japanese masterpiece like this dressmaker. And if you came here as a skeptic, I hope you're a believer now because I've given you every reason to believe in the quality and the caliber of these Japanese machines that came out of Japan post-World War II and in many ways helped to rebuild that economy after that awful, awful war was ended by the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the, the unconditional surrender of the Japanese people to the U.S. forces. I'm glad that we're not at war like that anymore. I'm glad that we're not dropping A-bombs anymore. Now, our current president, when he was vice president, dropped a lot of F-bombs. Yeah, he did. Sorry I said that, but it's true. It's true! All right, take care, everybody. God bless.